is that time Sunday 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Prophet David Taylor here for your weekly live prophetic word. I'm trying to get my phone straight for Periscope. Okay. All right. Hello, Periscope. Hello, Facebook. So glad to be with you again on this beautiful Sunday. Okay, and we've got the live prophetic word from the Lord. <clears throat> All right, today's prophetic word is chastening. Today's prophetic word is chastening. Some people pronounce it chastening. Okay, either way. So, let's say a prayer and we're going to dive right on in. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you, God, even for your chastening. Thank you for your judgments, because true and righteous are your judgments, oh God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace, and thank you for your mercy, even in the midst of chastening and judgment, because truly you are a good God, showing mercy to those that love you, oh God, showing mercy to us all. And I just thank you for your kindness. So I should be with me, oh God. I surrender myself to you now, Lord. I'm just a vessel for you to use, so breathe through me. Speak through me and let uh, what's said and done be said and done to your eye and your glory. I thank you for it. I believe you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, uh, y'all know I don't do this for money. I do this because the Lord called me to do it. But if you do want to donate to my ministry, I've had several people tell me that they wanted to sow into my ministry. So you can give through your Zelle app. You can give through Zelle. And my email there is prophetdavidtaylor@gmail.com. Or you can give through a cash app in my uh, my uh, sign there is dollar sign DMT2. Not the number two, but DMT and then two capitalized on cash app. And I will have those links on my Twitter and on my Facebook live page. Okay, if you do want to. So to my ministry and where that money goes is it helps me to make more music. Helps me to make more music videos. And then I'm working on establishing... Uh, my meet my my house project and so i have a lot that i'm always doing so it's going to expanding my ministry okay so i just want to thank you in advance for all of those of you that choose to bless me all right so let's dive into our prophetic word <clears throat> which is chastening okay i'm going to pronounce it chastening even though i know it could be chastening or chastening we're going to look at hebrews 12 11 which is probably the most famous scripture in the Bible on this subject. Okay, Hebrews 12, 11, probably the most famous scripture in the Bible on this subject. As I've told you before, some scholars say that Hebrews was written by Apostle Paul. Some scholars say that Hebrews was written, Hebrews was written by Apollos, and one of Paul's contemporaries. And some people say that Hebrews was written by Luke. But all scholars do not agree on who actually wrote the book of Hebrews. The one thing that is agreed upon, however, is that Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians. Today we would call them, sometimes they're called Jews for Jesus, uh, another term is Messianic believers. And what that means is that they're Hebrews, they're Jewish people, they're physically the seed of Abraham, but they believe and have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, okay? That's who the book of Hebrews was written to, people that had realized that the Old Testament was done, that the Mosaic Law was done, and that the New Testament, grace and truth, came through Jesus Christ, and it was written in Jesus' blood, and it was ratified and enacted by the Lord's death. So Hebrews was written to Jewish believers that believe that and accept that and have transitioned into the new covenant under grace. Now, as Gentiles, as non-Jewish people, now Gentile just means someone that's not Jewish, not Israelite, not a Hebrew. As Gentiles, the only covenant we ever had with God was the New Testament. So all we have known is Jesus, okay? So we never were under the Mosaic Law as Gentiles, as non-Israelites. So the only covenant we ever had with God was the new one. So praise God for that. But again, the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians. So we're going to start at Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 11. I'm going to read a couple of different translations as normal. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. I'm going to start with the King James Version. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness 
unto them which are exercised thereby. Okay, a New American Standard Bible. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Okay, uh, Berean Study Bible. No discipline. Uh, okay, well, those two good things. And all discipline, oh, I'm sorry, that's Berean Literal Bible. And all discipline indeed for those being present does not seem to be of joy, but of grief. But afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those having been trained by it. Okay, Berean Study Bible. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who have been trained by it. Now, why do I read scripture and why do I read multiple translations even during the prophetic? because we have to have a foundation in the written word of God to understand the other two levels. There's three levels of word. There's the written word of God. There's the living word of God, which is Jesus. And then there's the rainbow word of God, the fresh breathed word of God that normally comes through the apostolic and the prophetic. You need all three. And one of the reasons that God had the scriptures written down is so that we would know how he thinks. So we would have his written word as a basis to build our lives and to understand his thoughts, his commandments, his judgments, his responses. And so that we can use that as a springboard to get to know the God of the Bible. In the Old Testament, until Moses came, all they had was a prophetic word. All they had was a personal relationship with God. Nothing was written down until Moses. OK, nobody in the Bible had the full Bible like we do. So we are blessed indeed. So <clears throat> that's why I read so much scripture, because if you want to understand the prophetic rhema word, it's, it's never going to be in conflict with the written word. That's why. OK, so in all those <clears throat> versions, it says in the King James, it says no chastening. But just about every other version says no discipline. So let's look at that word in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, that word discipline uh, means tutorage education or training by implication disciplinary correction now i'm reading out of my strong's uh, exhaustive concordance that's 3809 if you want to look it up just so you know i'm not making stuff up i'm not just pulling stuff out of thin air so strong's exhaustive concordance entry number 3809 on the new testament side 3809 and that word there is paideia and it means tutorage, educational training, by implication, disciplinary correction. So what the scripture is saying is that the Lord will discipline us. He will chasten us. And the Lord will tutor us. So in other words, there's some things about Jesus, about life, about God's kingdom, and about the way we're supposed to live that we don't know. So we have to be tutored the same way you would have a tutor for a subject in school. There are some subjects, some things that God wants to teach you that he's got to tutor you on. OK, and then it says education or training. That means some things you need to be educated on. There's some things that you don't know. That's why one of the most dangerous attitudes you can have both as a Christian and as a person in general is when you think you know everything. When you think that what you know is all there is to know, you are in trouble. You are in more trouble than you realize. God is always bigger than you think he is. You can't fit God down into your mind. Life is always bigger than you think it is. You can't fit life into your mind. And over and over and over and over again, as humans, we think that what we know is all there is to know, that what we've seen is, is all there is to see, and what we've experienced is all that life entails. And that's not true. So the Lord has to teach us. He has to educate us, okay? And then it says, or training. <clears throat> What's the difference between teaching and training? I will tell you the difference. Teaching is when you convey concepts. Training is when you impart skill. <clears throat> so in other words, teaching is where I get it in your head. Training is where I get it in your hands. Okay? So if I'm teaching you a concept, I'm teaching you how something works, I'm teaching you the idea, that's for your head. That's teaching. Training 
means I know how to apply the concept, which is why whenever you take a math class, you have to have math homework. Because just getting the concept of, you know, addition, subtraction, algebra, geometry, whatever, is not good enough. You have to do the problems. You have to do the work. That's training. That's applying the teaching and the concepts. So teaching is for your head. Concepts. Training is for your hands. Application. Skill. Can I do it? Okay? Now, uh, so it says, no discipline, no teaching seems enjoyable at the time. Now, that's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, the Word of God says that when the Lord is trying to tutor you, when he's trying to train you, when he's trying to educate you, and also that word discipline also means, by implication, disciplinary correction. In other words, just to keep it real and make it plain, sometimes the Lord has put us in check. Sometimes we're out of control. Sometimes we're not being obedient. Sometimes the path that we're on is going to lead to our own destruction. And the Lord will step in as a good parent, as a good father, and put us in check. Okay? That's disciplinary correction. So we got tutorage, education, training, disciplinary correction, all bound up in that word discipline. Now, the Bible says it's not enjoyable at the time, and it's not. <clears throat> Anytime you're being whipped... <clears throat> anytime you're being chastised, anytime you're being told no, anytime your flesh is being told no, because there's a difference between you and your flesh. Understand that. Your flesh is that rebellious nature that we got from Adam and Eve when they sinned against God, and then we became the opposite of God when they ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and walked in lust and pride. That's your flesh, that nature. That's not you, but that flesh nature is a real thing, and it lives in these mortal bodies. And we have to deal with it every day until we got until we die and go to the glory realm. But sometimes you need correction. Sometimes it's not your flesh. Sometimes God will correct you by saying your dream is too small. Like you at one level and God said, no, you need to change your thinking. Or you have a dream, but you're not doing the things necessary to make that dream come to pass. God needs to correct that behavior. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen if you're not taking the steps necessary to birth that dream. Sometimes God has to tell you no, meaning what you wanted. I'll give you a personal example. There was something I was dreaming about my whole life since I was a little boy. And when I say my whole life, I mean my whole life since I was a little boy. And it kept me going through rough times. And when I got grown, the Lord told me no. And I was stunned. So what the Lord did was he gave me a little taste of what I thought I wanted. And after I had a little taste, I was like, yeah, no, Lord, you was right. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't actually want to do the thing that I was dreaming about. I did, it, I, it wasn't what I thought it was. Okay? So he was gracious to give me a little taste of it. But he helped me understand his no. And that's why he was gracious. Because he doesn't owe me an explanation. But he helped me understand that you wouldn't actually be happy if you had that what you thought you were dreaming about. So sometimes... God has to say that thing what you're doing is not actually what's best for you. Sometimes what God says in his correction is not now. That's not the same as no. No means it's not going to happen. Not now means that this isn't the season. Let me tell you something. I have learned through chastening and discipline and correction that, that the smartest thing you can do as a believer is stay in sync with the Lord, stay in step with Christ. If you try to birth something before the time, like when Moses tried to deliver the Egyptians, but he wasn't ready, so he rose up in his own strength and tried to deliver the Hebrews, I'm sorry, tried to deliver the Jews. He rose up and killed the Egyptian that was oppressing the Hebrew. And then he committed murder and he did it in public and he got found out and he ran because deliverance was in him, but it wasn't time. Moses went back to Egypt 40 years later, armed with the tools of God, with the command from God, with the rod of God, with Aaron, with power from God, with all that different kind of stuff. It was 40 years later when Moses actually got to walk into the deliverance that he knew he was called to walk in. It was in him, but when he tried to do it, he tried to do it way out of season. He wasn't ready. Okay? And let me tell you one of the most painful things about life you can discover, and that is that if you do things after your season, because some seasons are gone, when they're gone, they're gone. For example, 
you have uh, one shot in your life to be a child. You're only, if you live to be 100 years old, you're only a child for less than 15% of your life. 15% or less of your life is spent as a child. You really only have 10 good years to really be a kid. Birth through 10, that first decade, that's really the only time you are an actual kid. When you turn 11 or 12, you're in your tween years, you're on your way to young adulthood. And then when you hit 13 to 19, you've hit puberty in full bloom. And now you are capable of sexual reproduction. You're, you're able to make babies. So that's a different stage of life, 13 to 19. So you really only have a decade of actually being a child. If <laughs> Whatever you do or don't get in your childhood, once it's gone, it's gone. It's not coming back. Now, there's that old saying, once a man, twice a child, saying sometimes when you get super old, people have to, have to take care of you. Sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. But what is true is that you only get one shot at being a child. And many times things happen to us in our childhood that aren't fair or aren't right, but your childhood is not coming back. And sometimes we hold on to what should have happened or what did happen or what wasn't right or whatever. We hold on to that sometimes for decades. Sometimes we're well into our 30s and our 40s and our 50s and we're still holding on to those childhood things and we need healing, we need deliverance, we need forgiveness, we need understanding, but them years ain't coming back. That's the thing. Another thing is a lot of people go to school as an adult. There's nothing wrong with going to school or back to school as an adult because when you're 18, you're an adult. But I mean, if you go back to school in later years, normally uh, 30 years and older, one of the things you discover when you go back to school as an adult is that playtime is over. A whole lot of people wish, especially people that had to get their GED, and don't misunderstand me, there is nothing wrong with getting your GED, your high school equivalency. And if you got it, praise God. And if you don't have it, then I encourage you to get it. But a whole lot of people that, have, that choose to do it that way realize, I should have went to class when I was in high school. Okay, you only got them high school, them high school years ain't coming back. So if you didn't graduate when you should have graduated, then you have to go back and get that equivalency. Nothing wrong with that. But a whole lot of people in their 20s sitting in class with, you know, 18 and 19 year olds and people that are out of the age range realize I should have handled this business when I had my four years of high school and been done with it. Them high school years ain't coming back. They're not coming back. OK, so that's uh, an example of what I mean about how the most important thing you can do as a Christian is stay in step with God, because God literally has a plan for every single season of your life. Don't be listening to these people that tell you that you have time or gifts to waste. No, you don't. You only have virginity one time. That's one time gift. You only have childhood for them 10 years. That's one time gift. OK, you only have your first love one time. That's a one time gift. OK, all that youth and energy and strength in your teen years comes from the hormones, come from, comes from puberty. That's only for a season. That doesn't last lifelong. OK, and so don't ever listen to somebody that tells you that you've got time to waste. Oh, you're young. You've got time. No, wrong. Fail. You need to seek the face of God no matter where you are in life. But he's because God has a plan for exactly where you are age-wise or stage of life, and you want to stay in sync with that plan, okay? For example, if God calls you to start a family late in life like Abraham and Sarah, God called them to do that. If God calls you to start a family late in life like Elizabeth and Zacharias, the parents of John the Baptist, God called them to do that. But if God don't call you to do that, then you might not want to be starting a family at 75 years of age. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Most women can't have children that old, but men, you know, if your body still works, you can still father a child. But if you father kids at that age, you might not be around to see them grow up. OK, you, you probably don't have 75 years in front of you like you have 75 years behind you if you're just having kids then. But I know men have done it. I read a story last year about a man that had his first baby at the age of 80. And he had actually he, he claimed that he was a virgin. And so it was. First time for him for everything. So I don't know if that's true or not, and that's not provable, okay? But the point I'm trying to make is that having kids at 75 and 80 is not the same as having kids in your young years, 18, 22, 25, 30, whatever. It's not the same thing. 
And so that's why it's important to seek the face of God, no matter where you are, and ask the Lord, what is your will for me during this season? And if you don't like what the Lord has to say, he might have to chasten you. He might have to discipline you. Now, let me show you another form of chastening, still in Hebrews 12, 11. 12, 11. One of the ways that God chastens you is what I mentioned before, is that sometimes the Lord will let you have your way. Okay, that's one of the worst things God could ever do, is let you have your way. Because we don't know what we're talking about, and we don't know that we don't know. And one of my most favorite examples, I'll give you two examples. One of the big, biggest examples about how we don't know what we're talking about is with money. What happens when you give young people a lot of money? Okay, many times, unless they're extraordinarily wise, they tend to run through it, they tend to burn through it. That happens to a lot of people in their professional careers when they have their money making years. They tend to burn through that money. Do you know why? Because they think it's always going to be like it is right now. And then you get used to a certain lifestyle. No, no, no. Like if you're an athlete, for example, you better do something with that money while you're in them heavy money making years because them years ain't coming back. No one's going to pay you that kind of money again. Okay? Example one. Example two is relationships. Most of us have been to a point in our lives where we fought to be in a wrong relationship, where we actually fought to be with someone that was all wrong for us, all wrong for us. And the Lord tried to tell you, and your mama tried to tell you, and your daddy tried to tell you, and your friends tried to tell you, and your pastor tried to tell you. You was like, uh -uh. <laughs> you didn't want to hear it. And then what happened? Then you had to suffer consequences. And that relationship cost you more than you thought it would. And God was trying to correct you and say, leave that boy alone. Leave that girl alone. That doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong with them. They're just not right for you. Understand? <laughs> Most of us have been through something like that. Okay? And if we had received the correction of the Lord, we could have saved ourselves a lot of trouble and a lot of heartache and a lot of problems if we had just listened when God was trying to put us in check. Because God... Now, here comes a principle. God will always talk to you first. If you didn't know that, then I want to share that with you, that the Lord will always talk to you first. If you are a child of God, you're not just going to go stumbling into situations. If there's danger, if you're going down the wrong path, if there's a wrong turn that you're making, the Lord will always, because he's faithful, he will always talk to you first. Do you know what the problem actually is? The problem actually is, is we don't listen. We don't receive his gentle correction. We don't hear that still, small voice. We don't receive, we don't want to hear it. We just want to have our way and do it our way. And if that happens, then God will step back and let you have your way. Somewhere further along down the road, you will be so sorry that you did it your way, you won't know what to do. You will be ashamed and embarrassed when you have to eat the fruit of what your way produced. That's why God was trying to correct us in the early stages because he knew how the story was going to end. That's why so many people are married to the wrong person. Everybody tried to tell you when you first hooked up with them, they won the one and you was like, no, you didn't want to hear it. Now you're in a marriage and you're unhappy, you're unfulfilled, a whole bunch of things might be going on in your life. And all that's because you went the wrong person. The Lord tried to tell you before you married them, they wasn't the one. You just didn't want to hear it. Okay? So many of us have been through that. That's what I mean about how important it is to receive the Lord's correction, receive the Lord's chastening. And even though it's not pleasant, and even though you don't want to hear it, it's still going to end up for your good, as the scripture says. Let's get back to the scripture. Later on, however, again, Hebrews 12, 11, later on, however, it yields a peaceful harvest of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So the Bible tells you right there later on, uh, out of the Hebrew, histeron, that means lastly, afterward, later, uh, more lately, eventually. So what the Bible is teaching you is that there's a time element involved. That's one of the things sometimes about God that we don't like, because... God can surely and truly do things like that. 
but he didn't even make the world like that. He took his time and made the world over six days and made mankind on the sixth day and the rest of it on the seventh day. He didn't even make everything all at once. So the Bible is teaching you through several scriptures, there's going to be a time element involved. And so sometimes that's what God uses to teach us patience. And in your daily walk with Christ, he's not going to tell you everything all at once on the one day. He's going to give you whatever he wants to give you day by day, which is what he said in the prayer. Remember, give us this day our daily bread. OK, so there's a time element, time element involved. But it says later on, however, it yields a peaceful harvest, a peaceful harvest of righteousness. What does that mean in practical terms? That means that uh, your life will have a greater sense of peace to it. And what you'll be reaping will be peaceful and righteous. It'll be right. It'll be right in the eyes of God, right in your eyes, and it will be a blessing. It won't be a burden. It won't be something that was birthed in the flesh. It'll be something that was born in the spirit because you listened to and obeyed Christ. But then, then the last part of that verse, you have to understand the conditions. It says, uh, it yields a harvest of righteousness and peace. Here it is to those who have been trained by it. Do not skip the last line of that verse. Now, I'm finna get really real up in here, okay? Some children, you can correct them and they learn a the lesson and they'll come back to you later and say, Dad, you was right, I was acting up. Thank you for disciplining, disciplining me. Thank you for putting me in check. Some children can get chastening and they don't learn nothing. Some children look like they get a whipping and they get more hard headed and stubborn. OK, because all, all people aren't the same. The Bible says that when God corrects you, you have to receive the training. What that means, <laughs> what that means is that when the Lord puts you in check and puts you on the right track and Whenever the Lord has to correct you, you then have to reorder your life to walk in the new correction that Jesus gave you. So in other words, if you're having health problems and you go before the Lord for healing and the Lord says, I will heal you, but you also need to change your diet. If the Lord says you need to you need to eat better, then you need to change what you eat, because God is not just saying he's going to release his divine power to heal you. Because if you keep living the way you're living, you're going to have to keep coming back for that healing. God is saying that you need to change the way you eat and the way you exercise, and that will solve some of those health problems. That's what I mean. So from that point forward, you have to have that new diet and that new exercise plan. If you don't, you're going to keep having them chronic problems. Okay? Uh, same with money, same with relationships, same with anything. If you're trying to make a marriage work, and you go before the Lord, if you go before the Lord and you do like most people, most people go to God and say, change that other person. You need to fix them because they ain't right. The Lord will always change you. OK, the one person you can't control, which is you. And he will take you to the word and he will show you how a marriage works because he's the one that invented marriage. He invented it for himself and he invented it to glorify him. It therefore does not work the way we think it should work. And it doesn't have to. So if you want your marriage to work, you've got to go to Jesus and let the Lord tell you what to do. And I can almost guarantee that whatever the Lord tells you, you're not going to like it. You would rather have your way and make that other person change. Mm -mm. The Lord's going to tell you what you need to do as a husband, or as a wife. But once the Lord tells you what to do, you have to keep doing it. <laughs> you can't just do it one time and then go back to your old way. That's not going to work. So the Bible says that it yields that peaceable fruit of righteousness. And the reason that I, I, I take so much time and I try to be detailed and meticulous, that's because I've heard so much bad teaching in my life since I was a child, because I've heard people that don't read like the whole verse or they don't get behind the language, the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic. They just spouting stuff off. They just pulling stuff out of thin air and all that bad teaching in, ends up messing up people. And I've heard people teach this verse and talk about it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness. No, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So in other words, you received what the Lord said, you did what the Lord said, and then you continued on that new path. 
God gave you the whooping, God gave you the correction, and then you said, okay, Jesus, I'm going to do differently. That, what I was doing before, that made you have to whip me, I ain't going to live that way anymore. I'm going to do this now, what you said. That's what that means. That's how you get your peaceable and, uh, and righteous harvest. That's how you get it. You can't just take the whipping and then go back to do what you was doing before. Worse stuff is going to come. Worse stuff is going to come. More whippings, more consequences, more everything of what you don't want. So the Bible says you've got to be trained by the correction, trained by the discipline. And then once you receive it, then you get that peaceable fruit. And I'm telling you, it's true. I can tell you in my own life. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. God has to do something on us called pride processing. Pride processing, because we all walk in pride. Pride is the, uh, one of the fundamental core elements of the flesh nature. And it was pride that made Adam and Eve feel like they could separate from God and still live. That goes against what God said. God told Adam, if you eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in English it says, thou shalt surely die. In Hebrew it says something closer to dying thou shalt die. So what God told Adam was that you have the freedom, son, to walk away from me if you want to, but if you do, it's gonna kill you. If you don't stay attached to me, uh, said God to Adam, you're going to die. So it's not that God didn't tell Adam what was gonna happen if he ate that fruit, but Adam went ahead and on and ate it anyway, and so did Eve after listening to the devil because they thought that they could have a higher quality of life if they separated from God. Eve believed that. Adam knew that was a lie, but he went with it anyway. God told him before he did that, that you're going to die if you do that. So we all are cursed and burdened with something called pride. And pride is the opposite of love. So God has to give us pride processing to help us come out of our pride. And it hurts, but it's worth it. So I was going to give you a personal example. One of the things that the Lord taught me when we were going through one level of pride processing, because it's continual, is that he taught me about letting go of, of the expected outcomes that I saw in my mind. Letting go of thinking that things had to happen a certain way or that it, they had to look a certain way or they had to happen at a certain time. So in other words, give control of the situation to him. God will always do what he said he was going to do, but it don't have to happen when you think, and it don't have to happen the way you think, and it don't have to look <laughs> like what you thought. And the Lord told me that that was just pride, that when I had all these things in my mind and I, I had decided that it had to go that way, the Lord told me that was pride. And then he broke that off me and showed me not to walk in that anymore. And when he did that, I had so much peace in my mind. I had peace in my mind like I had never had in my entire life. And I would never want to go back to the way I was thinking before. Because I had so much peace when I, when I just let go of thinking that my expectations were how things had to play out. But rather, turn control over to him. Because he'll always do what he said he was going to do, but it don't have to happen when you think. You think it's going to happen in May, and God has it scheduled for June of next year. And then you get all mad because it didn't happen in May. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but June of next year is better. God's scheduling, God's timing is better than yours. So God told Abraham he's going to be the father of many nations. If that was me, I would have thought that meant, so I'm about to have a lot of kids. And that's not what happened. <laughs> Abraham had the one kid by Hagar, which was not the will of God. And then he had Isaac by Sarah at 100 years old. I'm sure that's not what he had in mind when God changed his name to Abraham and told him, you're going to be the father of many nations. But it didn't look like what Abraham and Sarah thought it was going to look like. Both of them had to let go of trying to control the situation and let God do what he was going to do in his time. And you understand? That's an example of what I mean about chastening and discipline. It hurts when the Lord does it, but if you can make it through the hurt, then you learn, and if you learn the lesson, it brings you so much peace. You would never want to go back to the way you were before the discipline. And I would never want to go back to the way I was thinking. Because once you learn how to let go and let God, your mind literally floods with peace. You literally live the, uh, leave the outcomes and the details 
to the master, to the creator, to the potter, and you just be the clay. Let me do what he told me to do, and then whenever it comes to pass, whatever he wants, his timing is better than mine. His results are better than mine. His vision is bigger than mine. So you got to learn how to let your stuff go. I'm telling you, my mind has never been the same on the positive tip. I've had so much peace because I'm a type A person. I'm a creative person. I got a bunch of different projects going. At the same time, I always got stuff rolling around in my head. So my mind's always popping. My mind's always popping. And then when I learn how to let go of my expectations, I just had a level of peace. And I would never want to go back. But that's because the Lord chasing me. I didn't, I didn't do it on my own. The Lord chasing me. He disciplined me. He taught me about my pride and gave me a way of living that was better than the way I was living. You with me? All right. Amen and amen. So that's our prophetic word for today is chastening based on Hebrews 12, 11. Okay. So be sure to watch the video from the beginning to get the full, if you came in late, watch from the beginning, the beginning to get the full uh, understanding of what I was teaching. Now, when you see me close my eyes and pray in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost, is there anything else he wants me to release? Now, for those of you that don't understand why I do that or why a prophet might do that, it's because we don't want to do anything presumptuous. There's a scripture that says, Lord, save me from presumptuous sins. In other words, you only want to say what the Holy Ghost wants you to say. You don't want to be presuming and assuming the will of God. So you have to invoke the Holy Spirit. You have to ask him, is there anything else you want to release? Because these are his words, not mine. That's why I do that. And that's why sometimes people that walk in the prophetic get in trouble. They start presuming, you know, well, the Lord's mean this or this or that. And no, you better ask him. You better ask him before you speak. So that's why I do it. So here we go. Okay, all right. The image that the Lord just gave me was of a green and a yellow tree. And it was kind of like a two-tier tree. It's kind of yellow at the top and it got more green. Sometimes prophetically you get images. Sometimes you get sounds. Sometimes you get smells. Sometimes you get words. Prophetically, what that means, a yellow green tree, it means two things. It means that you know, there's fruitfulness and life, but that's the green. But the yellow means there's a ripening. It means that there's a ripening. And what that means is that some of the fruit you've been waiting on is finally starting to ripen. Because ain't nothing worse than premature fruit. Have you ever eaten an apple and that apple wasn't ready? Have you ever eaten a green banana and that banana not ready? <laughs> and here's the big one is grapes, man, because I love grapes. Have you ever eaten some grapes and them grapes was bitter? It was nice and green or nice and red or nice and burgundy or nice and black or nice and white, whatever kind of grapes you're into. They looked all right on the outside, but you've been into them grapes and they, it's kind of sour. Okay, well, that's because they weren't ripe yet. So what the Holy Ghost just showed me through that image, that means that some fruit is finally ripening. It means it's a time of ripening of some fruit. So that means that things that we've been laboring on, we've been planting and watering and working and toiling to try to make happen, that means some of it is finally starting to ripen. And that's a good word, man. That's good news. I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see exactly what he's talking about in my life because I got a lot of stuff I'm doing. But that also goes back to what I said about, about staying in step with the Holy Ghost through the season. Because left to our own devices, we will always try to birth unripe fruit. Almost every time. Almost every time we out there trying to do something, it ain't ready yet. So we have to wait on God's timing, all right? Okay, let me ask him if that's it. All right, amen and amen. <clears throat> and I'm going to leave this last thought with you. <clears throat> uh, never let anybody tell you that the prophetic isn't real. <clears throat> People only want God to manifest in ways that they are comfortable with. That's why people so easily accept evangelists, pastors, and teachers, because you can understand that. But apostles and prophets almost always come in ways that are 
out of the norm, uncomfortable. They don't look like the way people does it, the way people would do it. You know why? Because God gives us heavenly things. See, there's tongues in heaven. Oh, prophet, tell you, how do you know that? Because the scripture says that around God's throne, there are lightnings and thunderings and voices. And when the voice of Jesus speaks, it, has, it is as a sound of many waters. Tongues is a heavenly tool. It doesn't look like it would look on earth. That's why when the Holy Ghost fell on Pentecost, the, what did they do? They spoke in tongues. So don't ever let anybody tell you that the apostolic and the prophetic is not from God. It just many times doesn't look like the way we would do it. It don't look like what we think. And that's what I was telling you before about having to let go of your expectations because if you don't get rhema words from God, if you don't get a right now word from God in sync and in season, you're going to miss. And you're going to miss every time. Okay? All right. God bless you. Thanks to those of you that tuned in uh, to watch me live. Thanks to those of you that are listening on the podcast. Those of you that are watching me on Facebook, on Periscope, and those of you that are watching me on YouTube. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this Thursday is my No More Genies teaching. This Thursday at 7 o'clock. And uh, I'll be finishing up my series on the kingdom of heaven. And because uh, I've been teaching about what Jesus actually taught, which was the kingdom. Okay. And I've been going through the parables that the Lord taught about the kingdom. This Thursday at 7 o'clock uh, is No More Genies. So tune in for that. I'll be here next Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. My prophetic devotional, quarter two is out, but we're about to go to quarter three next month in July. I can't believe it's June already. Lord have mercy. Got a lot more stuff coming out. I've been releasing music. Uh, when I release music, I do that on New Music Friday at noon. So you can find that on this page. I think I'm going to set up a separate page for my hymns. I have a 150 hymn project, and I think I'm going to have a page just for my hymns so people can find them all in one place. Okay, because I have you know a lot more to go, and I'm totally excited about it. So I have a lot. So thank you for those of you that support my ministry with prayer, with attendance, with finances. God bless you. I really appreciate it. And remember to like and share these videos. Uh, liking and sharing these videos on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, and on Periscope uh, helps the word to get out. Because whenever there's a, there's a prophetic word released, we want to have to, to go around the world. We want everybody in the body of Christ to have a chance to hear it. All right? Amen and amen. God bless. So have a good rest of your Sunday. Have a great week. And remember that if the Lord is chasing you, it's because he loves you. He's trying to course correct you. He's trying to get you on the right path so you end up with a peaceable fruit of righteousness later. So listening to the, listen to the chastening. Listen to the discipline. Listen and receive the correction and make it be a part of your life. Okay? Amen and amen. God bless. I'll see you on Thursday.